second to last lecture of machine learning. And please, everybody, remove your laptops unless you're in the very last row. Um, few logistic things. So the project eight is out. As I said, don't worry. It's relatively easy. It's a lot easier than project seven, which is probably among the harder ones. Uh, the, the also the latest homework assignment is out. That is optional. Um, so you don't have to hand this in. The, there's two reasons why you should do it anyway. And that's A, because it's a good preparation for the exam, and B, because what you're deriving in project, in the homework six, is exactly what you have to implement in project eight. So it helps you a lot if you've done it. And if you, you know, then project eight is really trivial. Okay, uh, also some people asked about practice exams. I posted them on Piazza under resources. So if you at the very top is practice final exams or something. So please look at those um, in preparation. Uh, finally, I believe the uh, early the sign up for the conflict exam is now over, I believe. So there will be, I think, only very few people who uh, can't take the exam because of a, a university recognized conflict. And we will have an alternate date, so just uh, be ready. We will post that today, I believe. Okay, any questions about logist logistics? Okay, good. Um, we're talking about deep learning and neural networks. And so, as we, you know, talked last time, basically, in deep learning, we have a loss function of our uh, predictor H, our hypothesis, and this can just be, you know, some generic function that goes over all the different samples and computes some loss. For example, just, you know, a typical example may be the square loss. Um, H of xi minus yi squared. So this is a regression setting. And in neural networks are just a simple extension of linear classifiers. H of x is w transpose phi of x. And now comes the trick. Phi of x itself is a mapping. So phi of x equals some transition functions times u of x. And you know, let's just remove the bias. Um, and that's a one layer neural network. If you have multiple layers, you can just stick another function in here. And then you have phi prime of x equals sigma of u prime of phi double prime of x, and so on. You can make as many layers as you feel is necessary. u double prime of x. Right? So in this case, we have one, one, two, three, three layer neural network. OK, so the input comes in here. You multiply with the matrix, apply a transition function. The transition function can just be the max with 0. So you set everything that's negative to 0. Then you take the outcome that's a vector. You multiply by the matrix, set everything negative to 0. Take the outcome, multiply by matrix, set everything negative to 0. And then at the end, you have your regression. <clears throat> so what I want to talk today is how to learn such a neural network. So we have a loss function. And we've seen before, when you have a loss function and you have a classifier like this, that we just do gradient descent. And so neural networks, actually, you do exactly the same thing. The only thing is you don't just have that one vector w. You also have these matrices in between. All right, so these are your parameters. You have that w, that's the, the, last, uh, the last layer. And then you get all the intermediate layers each have a transition matrix. Uh, so how do you do? How do you do gradient descent? Well, the first thing is you have to take gradient, the gradient with respect to every single one of these matrices. And then actually, it's exactly the same thing as before. You just take the gradient, and then you just take a small step, just a small update. So you just say, you know, u becomes u minus alpha times the gradient. So it's just like good old gradient descent. And there's nothing special about it. The one thing that's a little tricky is that you have to take these gradients with respect to these, these, uh, these weight matrices that are hidden deep inside the network, right? So you basically have, if you think about it, you kind of have to go 
to this function, to this function, and so on, until you actually end up here. Right? And it turns out there's a very good trick how to do this, and it's called the chain rule. Who's heard of the chain rule? Awesome. Who's heard of chain smoking? All right. Uh, it's about the same, actually. Uh, um, okay, so here's what you do. Right? You basically say, well, the first gradient is simple, right? That's just the gradient is just, well, let me just write this, is dl dw. Okay, so in this case, this is just um, sum of our i equals 1 to n, and then we have w transpose phi of xi minus yi times phi of xi. All right, so that's just the gradient of the square loss, where h of x is this thing here. Okay? Any questions? Yeah? So is x all of our input data as row vectors, or is it a single vector? Oh, yeah, no, xi is just a sample, okay. a training sample. I don't need sum of all the training samples. That's the gradient. All right? Good question. Yes, any other questions? So, so far, this is nothing special at all, right? This is, just a, this is just a square loss. You implemented this, right? This was the ERM homework. You did exactly this. Phi of x was your feature vector, right? You just minimize the square loss. You just compute the gradient, and then when we do a gradient update, we just say w becomes w minus alpha times this fellow here. Okay? Raise your hand if you're with me. All right, awesome. <clears throat> now comes this guy here, right? And now it gets a little tricky. How do you get this guy? And, well, we just use the chain rule. So you just want to have the LDU. And if you use the chain rule, one thing you're going to realize is, well, you have to do all these chains, right, all the way. You know, each one gets more and more expensive. That's what you would think. But it turns out, actually, it's very cheap because you can reuse computation. And that's called backpropagation. Um, it took, actually, a long time for backpropagation to be invented. Like, long after neural networks were invented, People actually, at the beginning, they did not train it with a chain rule. And there's, there's good reasons for this. But, so, okay, we want to have the gradient with respect to this first matrix. It's basically inside this phi of x, the first weight matrix that we have. And how do we do this? Well, that's dl, and uh, that comes a trick. We can actually say d phi and then d phi to u. But one thing we're going to do, we're going to do a simple trick. We call this here a of x, this here a prime of x, this here a double prime of x. Okay, it's just a notation. So a of x basically takes the output of the previous layer and just multiplies it with the matrix. And then phi of x is just this transition function of a of x. Okay, any questions? Does that make sense? So it's kind of what I do is like, you know, we have these Russian women, like inside a woman is another woman. Now what I did is I kind of a half woman. That's kind of, you know, in like right in between two stages. I, I don't know if that makes any sense. But, you know, you see what I'm saying. <clears throat> okay, raise your hand if that makes sense. Uh, is A prime the derivative of A of A? Oh, no, no, no. No, sorry. The next layer is just A1. Uh, that's just the next layer down. I can also call this 1 and then 2. Does that help? This here is my one. One. And this here is zero. I don't know. I'm just trying to go into the layers. Make sense? Actually, let me go back to the primes. I prefer the primes. Yes, so basically all I'm saying is inside this layer, what ha what's happening, I take the, previous the output of the previous layer and multiply by the matrix. I call that A. And then I push it to a transition function, I call that phi. Okay? It's just, I just give the first step, and it's a two step approach. It gives each step now a name. <clears throat> so then with the chain rule, I can just say, well, this is the last, the gradient of the overall last function with respect to this u is by the chain rule, the gradient of the last function with respect to a, and then a with respect to u. Okay? <clears throat> Raise your hand if that makes sense. Awesome. Okay, good, good. If this is boring, it should be boring, right? And I'm trying to make it really like, mechanical, right? And because it's going to turn into an algorithm. Right? This is going to be a very simple algorithm that computes the gradients and just pops them out one by one. Every iteration, you get a new gradient. 
<coughs> All right, so now let's try the second gradient. What do we do? All right, so, sorry, this is u, u prime. It's one prime here. So now I would like to know the gradient of the last function with respect to this guy. All right, so I first go to the first representation. The first representation is a, a transformation of the second representation, and so on. So now I'm here. So how do I get this gradient? All right, so by chain rule, that's the same as before. I first go to this A, and then from this A, I go to U prime. So it's uh, DA, sorry, one second, DA prime, DA prime, DU prime. OK, so. <coughs> The trick is that what you do is you always take the gradient with respect to the, the function which encapsulates your gradient, uh, your, your weight, and then the gradient of A with respect to U. Now, can anyone tell me, what is the gradient of A with respect to U? So who knows it? So it's A of x equals U times pi of x, right? What's the A to U? That's just 5 of x, right? That's just 5 of x. Right? So that's really easy to compute. You have this, right? You had to compute it anyway. When you, when you, when you pushed an, an input to this function, you just save all these 5 of x's, right? And those are actually the gradients that you need here. Right? So you've already computed this part. Right? So this part is, is done, right? This is just, you know, these parts are done. These are just the 5 of x's. And what about this part? Well, this part you've already computed here. So all you need to do is compute this part, dA, dA prime. And it turns out that's very easy. Right? It's just actually the derivative of the transition function. So I'm not going to go through it in more detail, because it's boring, and it's on the homework assignment. So uh, now I just admitted that the homework is boring. But uh, never mind. <laughs> It's just something that's as tedious, it doesn't help you much if I do it in front of you. Uh, the best thing is if you just work through it. So please, you know, take this seriously. Go through the homework assignment and just, just you know, basically, like, the whole homework assignment, all it is, it just says, show that the gradient with respect to this thing is just the gradient with respect to this thing times some term, and so on. OK? <clears throat> and you just derive all these updates. The beautiful thing about it is, that ultimately, what you get out of this is a very simple algorithm that just says, all right, here's, I want to take the gradient with respect to all of, these, all of these different matrices. What do I do? I take the gradient with the first one, and then what I do, I just multiply this by, by a vector, and then I get the gradient with the second one. And then I multiply this again, and I get the gradient with the second, third one, and so on. So it's a very simple follow. And in fact, I put the pseudocode up in these notes. So if you look at these notes, where it says backwards parse, that's actually the pseudocode. So in project eight, that's what you have to implement, that code. And when I said it was easy, it's like, yes, it's three lines, three lines of pseudocode in my handwriting. Yeah? So um, I remember you mentioned that when you reached the past you used the? Um, like, in this example, we used the extent of all the examples that we have in the question. Oh, OK. Uh, the, uh, your question is whether we use really gradient descent or stochastic gradient descent. Give me two minutes. I get there. Yeah, that's right. So the key point is that when you go, when you compute the gradient with something that's deep down the neural network, and let's say you have thousand layers, right? All you need to do is you take the gradient of the layer right just beforehand, right? And you take almost all of it, and you just multiply it by one term, and now you get the next gradient. Okay. So the, the uh, computing all these gradients is actually very very efficient, right? And that's the key. Uh, taking these gradients is less and less important these days. So it used to be, you know, even five years ago, that you had to, like what PhD students did most of their time, is computing gradients and implementing gradients. Right? That was a huge pain. You had to make it fast and all the stuff. Nowadays, actually, this is really just a very recent development, is that all these languages have automatic, automatic differentiation. So you actually just compute a function, you just put in the function, and you say, Take gradient, uh, compute the gradient, and it computes the gradient symbolically. So this is something that only got very efficient in the last couple of years. <clears throat>
And uh, so nowadays, if you do you know, TensorFlow or you use PyTorch, et cetera, all these packages, they all take the gradient for you, so you don't have to do it anymore. But it's important to know what's going on. <clears throat> all right, any questions? All right, good. So now we know how to take the gradient. And so especially once you've done the homework, it's going to be crystal clear to you. <clears throat> Uh, okay, good. So basically we have our network and what we get is we get all these different gradients and then all we need to do is just gradient descent, right? So we just say, you know, W becomes W minus alpha times DL DW, U becomes U minus alpha times DL DU, and so on. And you do this for all of these and then you start over. All right, so there's two more subtleties, two more changes to what we've done before. So this is, this is just normal gradient descent, and we've done this now, and you've implemented it. That's, however, a subtle, or a very important difference. And this was one of the reasons why people mocked neural networks for years. And that is that the function is not convex. So all the loss function that we've had in the past, when we derived gradient descent, and we just had linear classifiers, we had a convex function. Convex function look like this. So we said you can't just start anywhere you want, so we just started with a zero vector. And then we just take gradient steps, you know, and every single time we take a little step, we go further down, eventually we will get to the minimum. Right? So that was gradient descent on a convex function. We still use convex loss functions for neural networks, but it's not convex. Why is it not convex? What's happening? So my curly L on the very top left is a convex function, it's a square loss, it's a parabola. Yet I'm telling you it's not convex. Why is it not convex? Yeah? Because of phi, essentially, right? Because of the transition function, that's right. So you have a nonlinear function in there. So it's convex with respect to W, but it's no longer convex with respect to U, U prime, and U double prime, right? So the function is, you know, uh, because you have these nonlinearities, it, it's, uh, if you take the second derivative, you, it's very easy to show that it's not a convex function. So what you're trying to do is you're minimizing a function that looks like this. Right, something like this. Right? And so you're trying to find the minimum here. The first thing is, you may as well forget about finding the global minimum. You will never find the global minimum. Right? There's exponentially many local minima, like little, little values like these. But you will always get trapped in one of those. Right? <clears throat> so that's out of the window, finding the global minimum. Uh, what you want to do is you find to find a good local minimum. The first, so the most important thing is, the most important change to previous is that suddenly initialization matters. Where you start is no longer irrelevant. Before it was always irrelevant, right? You just, you start somewhere, just take the all zero vector because it's convenient. That's no longer the case, right? If you start here and you do gradient descent, what's going to happen? You're going to take steps down, steps down, steps down to here, right here, and you're going to converge to this minimum, right? Because gradient descent, you converge to the local minimum. If you start here, you're going to go here. If you start here, you start here, right? So initialization is a big deal. Yeah? Of course, if you can, if you can afford it, Right? Train 10 different networks and take the minimum. <laughs> What's even better is average the outputs and ensemble them. But yeah, you're right. <clears throat> okay, so initialization is now really important. And in fact, if you initialize with the old zero matrix, you will actually get horrible results. Right? Because then actually every single dimension is the same. Remember what we said last time. What do the low-level features learn? Right? These low-level features learn very simple functions. And then basically the next level learns more complicated functions, build out these little functions. But if they're all initialized the same, actually what happens is that every single function is the same. So what you want to do is initialize them randomly. So people just, you know, initialize these, w mat these U matrices and the W vectors with random noise. Low order Gaussian noise. Uh, so that's, that's, that's a really important uh, difference, you know between neural network optimization and, and uh, for example, SVMs. 
And that was one of the reasons people loved SVM so much, right? Because they were global. Um, uh, so they optimized things globally. You got the global minimum. You, you had guaranteed that everybody trains the same SVM on the same data gets exactly the same answer. With neural networks, you and I train neural network on the same data. We initialize randomly, we get different answers, right? So that confuses people, right? The people didn't like this. <clears throat> okay, good. Any questions about this? All right, so here comes the second thing, and that was something I mentioned last time, is stochastic gradient descent was really important. So here's the problem that people did. So people, the first time around, neural networks were around, they used these very aggressive solvers, like, you know, gradient descent, they were kind of approximated Hessian steps and so on. And these are great optimization algorithms because they get you to the minimum as quickly as possible, right? So, if, you know, you can't afford, usually you can't afford a Hessian, a Newton method, but people did approximate Newton's methods, which are very good, very, very eff effective, right? And so uh, people have known these for a long time, or the optimization community has developed these, and they converge to the minimum in just a couple of steps, and they are much, much faster than gradient descent, right? So people said, don't use gradient descent, use these much faster optimization algorithms, right? And so you start here, and it turns out, yeah, you're right, right? Like, just with a few steps, right? You're actually at the minimum. That's awesome. <clears throat> the problem with this is, and so, the, you know, and that worked great, but neural networks didn't do very well. And so the problem is that you're in a highly non-convex space. So where you start, there's always a terrible local minima right next, near, next to you, right? Not far away from you. And now if you use these very aggressive optimization algorithms that basically, you know, find and, you know, immediately converge to the local minimum, right? You will go right there. And, but often these are not the great minima, right? Often the minima are over here, right? Very far away from you. So what you would like to get is somewhere like to a deeper neon, uh, minima, which may be, you know, further away. And that's where stochastic gradient descent comes in. So let me tell you what stochastic gradient descent is. <laughs> right, here we go. So the gradient of every, single, of every single weight is basically dl du, right? It's basically the sum of all the data points, i equals 1 to n, you know, d, and then that little loss, du, right? So basically the, uh, we sum over every single data point, and we sum up, you know, every single data point contributes a little bit to the gradient, and we compute this overall, and then, uh, that's our final gradient. <clears throat> now here's, here's the idea behind stochastic gradient descent. So imagine you have a function like this. This is my function I'm trying to minimize. And I'd say it's non-convex. Like, you know, here's some other holes around here. So stochastic gradient descent is something very, very simple. He's saying, well, instead of computing the gradient over all the data points, which is the correct thing to do, I just approximate it. And approximate it with a single point. So I say, you know, dl du is roughly just this h of xi. It's roughly just the loss, the gradient of the loss of one single point. That's totally wrong, right? So the gradient is an average, like this here is basically an average of many little gradients, right? And what I'm saying is, okay, I'm just looking at one training sample at a time. I just compute one training sample, and that gives me, a, you know, I just compute the gradient that that sample gives me. I pretend that was my only training sample. So let's say I'm here, for example, right? The gradient points in this direction, right? Because it's orthogonal to this function, the last function. But if I just take a single sample, oh, I may take and point in this direction, right? So that's terrible. <clears throat> but it's something we've seen before. Where have we seen this before? A lot of terrible gradients. Boosting, right? It's exactly the same idea. So if you have a lot of noisy gradients, all you do is you just take a tiny little step size, right? <clears throat> you take a small step in this direction, right? And you know, on average, these gradients are exactly the correct gradient. 
Right? So sometimes they're a little bit to the right, a little bit to the left, etc. Right? Here we are back to the drunk, drunk uh, gradient descent algorithm. Right? So you take a bunch of steps, right? And you know, on average, you're kind of going in the right direction. And the cool thing is, this takes you, computing the exact gradient, takes you n operations because you have to go through your entire chain data set and compute the gradient, the, you know, the contribution of each one of your training points and sum them up. Right? So that's, that's your gradient. Right? Takes you order n time. Now what you do with stochastic gradient descent, in this time you can actually take n steps. So you take a little step, another little step, a little other step, and so on. And as you do this, right, you move along. And your gradient changes, because if you're here, the gradient actually points more in this direction, right? So after you've kind of passed half your data already, you've, you've actually made some progress, right? And now the future uh, half the data points, on average, don't point in this direction anymore of the original gradient. They now point in the direction of the gradient at the very point where I'm staying, right? Which actually goes more in this direction. So uh, if in the original gradient descent algorithm, you basically take some large steps, right, like this. And then you take a step like this, and like this, and so on. In stochastic gradient descent, you take many, many teeny little steps, right? <clears throat> but because you, know, because you kind of adapt your direction already as you go into the data set, you actually get to the, to the minimum faster. Any questions? Yeah? Okay, good, good. He's saying like, well, wait a second. Well, you know, you, you, you switched the story. Like initially you started out with a local minima, now you're telling me something about drunk people. <clears throat> Fair enough. That was not exactly what he said, but yeah. <clears throat> so here's, let me get to this. <laughs> so there's this, you know, there's, there's one reason why basically people um, didn't take stochastic gradient descent seriously. Stochastic gradient descent was known, but actually people, people thought it was a terrible algorithm. And I can tell you why. Because if I try to prove how many steps does it take me to find the exact minimum up to 10 to the minus 5 accuracy, right? It turns out with the stochastic gradient descent, it takes you forever. Why does it take you forever? Because initially, you get very close to the minimum. And then once you're there, you take a lot of random steps. You just never really hit it, right? So that's, again, once again, we had this, this, you know, the drunk guy walks home, right? He gets to his house, and then he can't find the damn keyhole, right? <laughs> So that's the problem, right? You're, you're right here, and because it's too noisy, you just never really converge, right? But that's not a big problem, because in machine learning, right, we don't actually care about the exact minimum. Right? The whole loss function was, was made up anyway, right? <laughs> <laughs> but here's an even better thing, right? And that gets us back to the optimization. Turns out, now we're walking home, right? And it turns out there's many little holes here, right? This function is non-convex, right? And there's many attractors here, right? There's little holes here. This is basically the function. The function looks like this, okay? When we're walking downhill, right? Now, if you're an exact gradient method, what are you going to do is you compute the gradient here, and you always kind of find exactly this minimum, right? But stochastic gradient descent is so noisy, what it's going to do, it's going to go past here. It's just not going to find the stupid minimum. It's going to walk right past it, right? So because it's such a terrible algorithm, right, it's actually great, right, because it doesn't, doesn't fall into every single hole along the way. And you only end up at some of the large holes, right, where it can't escape from. And so people hadn't thought about this, right, but it turns out that's exactly what you want. You want these large holes. Why is this? Right? People thought you want to have the really deep holes. You want to minimize your loss and get really, really deep, right? That's what gradient descent is really good at in these two, uh, second order methods. But turns out you don't actually want this. Imagine your function looks like this, right? <clears throat> right? So the minimum is actually here, this very, very steep loss, right? But I claim that's a terrible loss to get into. What you really want is you want to end up here. Can anyone tell me why? Any ideas? Yeah. Right, you're exactly right. This is your function. But this is a function, right? My last function, what is my last function? My last function is a function of my training set, right? L of h of xi, yi, okay? <clears throat> it's a function of two things, my data 
and my, my function, right, my, my hypothesis. If I fix the data, which I do here, then I just get a function of my hypothesis, and I try to find the minimum. But what are we actually going to do later on? Right? Later on, we're going to throw away the training data, and we're going to switch to test data. The moment we put in a different data set here, the function is going to change. And we have these really, really steep local minima. What happens? Right? Now, we can optimize this thing, and now, during test time, I actually have a different function. Right? Maybe it looks like this. Right? Well, oops, right? I was here, now I'm here. Right? Suddenly the minimum I found is really, really terrible. Right? Does that make sense? So if you have these very narrow minima, right? they tend to be very specific to the speci uh, data set that you're trained on. If you take very wide minima, right, it's unlikely that if you change the data, it would actually you know, it would change a lot. So if you are, what you really want is to get as low as possible in your loss function on a really wide minimum. And that's the only thing that SGD is capable of finding. <laughs> right? And so that was actually, that was crucial. Yeah? Um, so if you already have a very large data set that you can afford to overfit and minimum that works no longer. If you have a very large data set and you can afford to overfit so then you're not overfitting anymore, I guess. So then these ef uh, effects go, they, they, this becomes less dangerous. Right? That's basically what it means. Like the, the, if you have a very large data set, then the change of function becomes very small. That's basically what it is. Yeah? It may have been okay. It may have been okay. But, but it's, you know, what is a very large data set, right? So, you know, there's always a lot, more, these are very high dimensional spaces, right? You're always undersampled, right? <clears throat> so, what people found, and initially they just found it empirically, and nobody could really answer it, is that if you train your neural network with SGD, it suddenly worked a lot better. And it took us a long time to understand where that came from. <clears throat> yeah? Is the number of gradient steps bounded by the number of training points? No, no, you go over the data set over and over again. So in gradient descent, one time, basically, what you do is you just go over all the data points, compute the gradient, take a gradient step, right? So now what you do is you take a data point at random, compute that little approximation of the gradient, make a gradient update, and uh, just keep iterating this. Yeah, so the, you can't really guarantee it. It's just that basically, if you have a very narrow neural network, right, then you basically, sorry, a very narrow minimum, right? I mean, there's a high dimensional space, right? In the one dimensional space, it seems obvious that this thing falls in here, right? But even a two dimensional space, right? Imagine this here is my function, and here's a tiny little hole, right? But if I, I get too close, I actually fall in here, right? The gradient suddenly points in this direction, it doesn't point in this direction anymore, right? But because the SGD is so noisy, Occasionally you're going to point out of it again and take a step out of it and now I'm, now I'm clear, right? So it seems unlikely that you actually will end up there. Right? It's just you're basically shaking it, right? And so actually the trick what people really do actually to optimize these things, they do two tricks in practice. The first one is they don't actually just take one point that's at random, they take around 64, 128 points. <clears throat> and take, they call it mini batches. <clears throat> and the reason is just very simple, it's just because if you Propagate a single point through a network, or 64 is about the same cost. That's just because new computers have these little parallel vectors and so on, right? So it's actually, you have an L1 cache, et cetera. So it's actually, it's just efficient to do this. Um, one, one second, yeah. And the second thing is that what you do is initially, and this goes back to your question, how can we guarantee that you don't fall on these local minima? Initially, you take a pretty large learning rate, okay? So then you get a really noisy, you know, Kind of like, ah, you know. Um, but the, the, the good thing is this prevents you from falling into small local minima, and you get close to the actual area where the local minimum is. So maybe you do 100 epochs. 100 epochs is, epoch is you once go over your entire data set, right? 100 epochs with a large learning rate. And then after that, you're kind of somewhere here, right? Now you're just jumping around, right? So this looks a little like this. Like your function, you know, now you're in here, right? 
And what you're doing is you're jumping back and forth between this, right? Because your steps are too large. And then what you do is you lower your learning rate by a factor of 10. And then you basically take small steps, and that means now I'm converging to the actual local minimum. Let me, let me draw it one more time. So here's kind of the idea, right? Imagine your function typically looks like something like this. Right, so here's the minimum. So what you want to do, let's say you start out here. Initially, you take a lot of steps, right, random steps. Right? They're very noisy to get you somewhere here. Now you're just bouncing back and forth. <clears throat> so you do this for a couple steps until you basically don't make progress anymore. And then once you're here, you take a small learning rate. And now you basically move down here until you get the minimum. Okay? And when you look at the loss, it literally looks like this. Like if you look at the loss of modern neural networks, it, kind of, it looks like this. right? And then you drop the learning rate, and it looks like this. Right? And sometimes people drop the learning rate one more time. <laughs> OK, yeah? Yeah, so on this, if you would go like, to run into your long learning rate of the one family, why can't you say the second order? Like, you can, you can, absolutely right. So his question is you know, once you've done SGD for a while and now you're pretty confident you're across, near the local minimum, you know, why don't you just now use a second order method? And you can. Uh, in practice, it's just typically not worth it to implement it even because now you're, you know, you did a lot of your, you know, you, you just take a couple of iterations of the small learning rate and you're, you're good to go. But yeah, you could, absolutely. Yeah? Um, is there a more uh, mathematical or technical explanation why behind the, the guarantee that SGD makes that it's eventually able to find that, that minimum that we want? Because, like, being noisy, Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. There is. It's just, um, it would take me, you know, a month to explain it. But, you know, um, uh, if, if you're interested in it, there basically there is a whole uh, body of literature now that analyzed, I'm sorry, the question was, um, is there a more rigorous answer why SGD uh, gives us good local minima? Right? And um, the answer is yes. Um, the, the, there's multiple... You can formalize this in multiple ways. And if you want to, if you come after lecture, I can give you a few intuitions why that is the case. Yeah? Um, what if you have two, like, very wide? Oh, yeah, yeah. So the question is, like, what if, what if your function looks like this, right? That's a bunch of, you know, wide. And actually, that's what it's going to look like, right? You have millions of parameters. You're in a million dimensional space, right? There's not just a few of those, right? There's billions of minima, right? Um, you will end up in one of them. <laughs> One thing that's nice about this, though, is that if you want to do bagging with neural networks, you typically have enough randomness that you don't have to subsample your data. So typically, when you do bagging, you subsample n data points with replacement. With neural networks, because you know, if you just initialize your network randomly, you start in a totally different part of the space, you end up in a lo different local minimum. Without even subsampling your data set differently, you actually get quite differently behaving neural networks. Surprisingly, they tend to have roughly the same error rates, but they make very different mistakes. And this makes neural networks amazingly well suited for ensembling. So if you really want to get the lowest error, for example, in the Kaggle competition, right? So what you do is you just train five neural networks and you average their results, right? And that actually makes a huge, huge improvement. Right? Okay, any more questions? <clears throat> All right, so um, I, have, I want to show you a few things. OK, good. Uh, two last things. So actually, before we, we finish, I want to still get to one thing. What's the neuron in neural networks? Right, so people always talk about neuro, like, why is it called neural networks? And so this is all just functions. And I try to explain it that way because I think that's actually kind of, it's really not that different from what we've done so far in the class. But let me quickly explain to you why people call it neural networks and what's the neural view. And I, I'm not a big fan of it because it leads to weird mega articles in Wired magazine or something. <clears throat> but basically what people say is, well, you can write this as a graph in some sense, right? So you have your x comes in, and I, I write, I, this is kind of these, these images that people draw, but every single dimension of x is a little ball here, a little circle. 
Okay, so this, this is my vector x. And this is the first, the value of the first dimension, second dimension. So, you know, this is like a five-dimensional vector. Okay, makes sense. It's just a vector notation. Raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, awesome. So now, what do I do? I stick my x in here. Ah, uh, I remove the. Right, and what do I get? I get. Um, Yeah, my x I stick into this double, you know, into this this first function. So I get a new representation. Let's call this phi double prime of x, right? And this has a bunch of dimensions. And the transition here is x goes to u times x, right? U times x basically. That's what it is, right? So phi x x equals or u is sorry, sigma of u double prime times x. That's that's what it is. Okay. Make sense? Raise your hand if that makes sense. Okay, good. And now we can write again. This here is my phi prime of x. This is my phi of x. And this here is my h of x. <clears throat> and now if I think about this, what is this here? Well, this here is a function of every single input. So what people do is they draw, draw an arrow. I just say, this value here, the first dimension of this guy is in it's basically the first row of this U matrix times X. So this is, so they just call these, these connections. And they have, so everything is basically connected here. <clears throat> and then you do this for every single, every single layer. And now you have a network, right? <clears throat> I don't like it. I can tell you why I don't like it. It's because people that have done these analogies with the brain and people have then analyzed these neurons and said like, what, what do these neurons do, et cetera. And, and, Oh, the problem, the, the reason I don't like it very much is because it's really just a, an end, you know, a d-dimensional space, right? And you can just rotate the space and you get totally different representation, but it's exactly the same output, right? So in some sense, it seems odd to interpret the different dimensions of the space. I, I don't see too much value in this, right? Um, but, but it also has led to a lot of misinterpretation, of uh, misunderstandings between people think, a, this is what the brain does, which is not true, right? Or they say this is kind of, you know, these, these neurons are doing a lot more than they are actually doing. It's really just a function phi of x, and, you know, of course, that's a, you know, some d-dimensional vector, so each one of these vectors has a value. But just, you know, it's important for you to know when people say, oh, I take a look at a neuron, the value of a neuron, what they really mean is just, you know, one of the dimensions of this, this upper vector. Any questions? By the way, initially it was inspired by the brain, right? So the original neural networks uh, <clears throat> came from that direction. Yeah. Oh, okay, good. Um, in practice, do people use anything else than rectified linear unit? And uh, the answer is nowadays rectified linear units are very, very popular, and. Um, the reason is actually quite simple, is that these, what people used before, and so people thought you have to use a continuous function and differentiable function. So rectified linear unit, if you paid close attention, you realize it's not differentiable. So you do gradient descent on a non-differentiable function, right? That seemed crazy, right? And that leads to all sorts of problems. Turns out if you do SGD, it's so noisy anyway, it doesn't really matter, right? And so, when people started using STD, you could actually use rectified linear units, right? <clears throat> and then actually the advantages over these tangent and sigmoid functions became apparent because these tangent and sigmoid functions are very, very flat, right? So remember what they look like. They kind of, they map everything from to zero to one, essentially. And you get you basically what these networks with sigmoid and tangent uh, functions get is they saturate very quickly. So rectified linear units tend to be better at not getting trapped in local minima. Yeah? So in weighted decay, well, they just use local to get very Oh, I see. Yeah, weight was a big deal when you use these sigmoid functions because you want to keep them in the middle. Weight decay is just another word for L2 regularization. There's nothing else, right? It's just something, it was just invented parallel and was called weight decay. So people also use regularization on the weights. But yeah, so it's less important for uh, rectified linear units, but it's still good to avoid overfitting. Okay, so quick, um, 
OK, good. So this is the demo I wanted to show you last time. And it didn't really work, so, so now here it is. So this, here's after this, this function that I, the black dots are basically my training points. And actually, on the left-hand side is a neural network with rectified linear units. And you see here the structure is one input, two hidden nodes, and one output. So two hidden nodes means my first function maps my one-dimensional input into a two-dimensional output. And then the next layer takes the two-dimensional output, maps it to a one-dimensional output. So what you basically map here is the number of dimensions. And what you see here is the rectified linear unit has two nodes. So what it does is it basically you know, has first you know, these two, uh, has basically two, two change points. And you see tan H is much, much, much smoother. Right? I can now introduce four nodes. And one thing you can see here, this is the reason people thought tan H is much better. right? Because tan H here almost hits every single training point. Right? The error is much lower. Whereas rectified linear unit is kind of, you know, they are kind of struggling here. But the reason is these problems that rectified linear units have is because they are hard to optimize. Go away when you have millions of them, right? Then basically there's always some that point in the right direction. And so rectified linear units turn, to be, turn out to be better at complex problems, but they are worse at these little demos, which was misleading. <clears throat> so now, you know, I can make eight, eight dimensional hidden representation. And, and so on. So, you know, if I make it more and more complex, you see, uh, you know, one thing you can see here, the tan h function you know, optimizes this very, very nicely. And uh, here you still have these, these uh, piecewise linear functions. One thing you can see here is that, in some sense, it's hallucinating some, some thing here, right? So the function goes up here, despite there's no data to support this. That's, that's fine. <coughs> All right. Um, one thing I still want to show you real quick is, so here's a, a, one thing, TensorFlow. So I don't know, TensorFlow is a free package from Google. Actually, most people prefer PyTorch, actually, that comes from Facebook. But I think TensorFlow is a little easier to use. Um, what you can see here is we can take a little data set. These are my data points, uh, positive and negative, And I can now construct a neural network. You can play with this if you just type in TensorFlow Playground. It's a nice little demo that they provide. And so here's my input. This is the first dimension of my input. This is the second dimension of my input. So <clears throat> these are either basically, this is my x coordinates, my y coordinates. Um, then I have a bunch of a four dimensional, I learn a four dimensional representation. This is my phi of x. And this here is my output. Let's just make a one dimensional output. Why not? And I can now train this thing. And what you see is here, here's the output, right? So it, it has now trained this. Uh, <clears throat> and it you now gets it all correct, right? And so one thing I can now look at, I can actually look at these. In a one-layer neural network, this, this actually looking at these neurons makes sense. So here, actually, what you see is it learned a bunch of functions. <laughs> okay, now type in XOR, make it a little harder, and optimize this. And you can see here, right? Oh, it's struggling. Come on. All right, so here's what you do. You, just, you know, if it struggles, you just add more, more neurons, right? So here we go. All right, here we go. Better, right? <clears throat> So, and, and what you see is these, this here is my inputs, and I can now look at, when I hover over this, you can see this image here on the right changes. So what it shows me is what the activations are of this particular function. And so you guys see it, it learns these individual little functions, and the final is now a composite of these functions, which is exactly, you know, nails the, the X or data set, right? <clears throat> um, now I can do something really hard, but I can do this one first, this one should be easier. This here is now, it should be able to nail this in no time. Oh, yeah. Oh, beautiful, right? Um, and now the spiral. Spiral is actually very hard, right? And so we can now see if this works. It probably won't get it, actually. What is it doing? Oh, yeah. So one thing you can do now is we can add a lot more neurons. See what it does? No. All right, we add another layer. It's like a lasagna. More layers is usually better. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> is it doing something? Oh, it's starting. It's starting. The whole thing is runs in JavaScript on my laptop, so it's a little unfair, right? I mean, <sighs> there's like. <clears throat> All right, it's, it's doing something. Well, we can add a lot more. I don't know. Let's just, you know, okay, let's just max it out. Let's do rectified linear units. Okay. 
and see what happens. No, not yet. It, 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 it will get there eventually. It, it, will, it can do it. It can do it. It just takes a while. <clears throat> All right, let me interrupt this. One last thing. So just last time I mentioned that this has become extremely powerful with images. And so there's actually, just to show you, here's an example. This Clarify is a startup. They actually they sell their deep learning community. All they've done is train deep nets. To, you take input as images and then classifies on the right the classes that it gets put into. So this is an image that basically says the sunset, water, dawn, dusk, and so on. And so one thing we can now do is we can try our own image. So I can actually go to Google image search and um, I know what should I search for? Any elephant? Killian. Killian. All right. <laughs> <laughs> I actually have my. <laughs> <laughs> That's my search. <laughs> so <you> can, <laughs> All right, so here's an image that's a little small. All right, we can try it. He's a Oh, this this how about this? This is a picture of when I was younger. <laughs> when I still lived in Germany. Oh, okay, never mind. All right, so here's the image. <laughs> All right, I'm not a robot. Okay, what does it say? It says, success! Oh my god! <laughs> All right, we gotta leave on a high note. <laughs> so this is the last one. See you all next, uh, on Wednesday. <laughs>